Thanks for joining me for the Pray for Micah podcast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a review, and check out my YouTube channel and follow me on social media. Pray for Micah Pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And now, on with the show. Welcome to the Pray for Micah podcast. And now your host, Micah Chrisman. Hello, welcome to the Pray for Micah podcast, where we explore art, activism, spirituality, and our cosmic insignificance, slash significance, because the significance we give it is what makes life meaningful to us. And uh, yeah, welcome to 2023, everybody. Uh, We took a little hiatus, a little break uh, for the past month, mainly just because the guests I want to have on the show were all just hell bent on the holidays and uh, bent over backwards schedule wise. And so I just figured it was a good time to just take a break. So for all you content hungry people out there, I apologize. We're now coming out into the new year with a bang. I'm here with Justice Gatson. Yes, yes. She is with the Real Justice Network. And we're going to get into all the things that they do. But some of the stuff that they address is birth justice, survivor support, participatory defense teams, community housing, um, programs like By the Block, and community bailout fund. Yes, yes. So I've got the Kansas City hot take here. Justice Gatson is the the primo, just cream of the crop people doing justice work here. Her name's Justice. (laughs) (laughs) But also, uh, we're doing a documentary about you for my everyday, my you know, nine to five job with mm-hmm. uh, Be Great Together mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and our kind of division docu course. Yep. And so that'll be coming out in March, I believe, yep. is yep. when we'll be having your story come out, your life story. And just spending that, that week with you on set and hearing some of your story and life, I was like, I, I, I need to have her as a guest. And so thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. Um, thank you for the introduction. And happy new year to you. Happy new year. Happy new year to everybody. Um, I really want it to be a happy new year for us. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Was 2022. Like, yeah, the last time I saw you, uh, you were staying at an Airbnb because you had family in town. And then just this whole, uh, lack of better words, clusterfuck of a situation (laughs) happened. (laughs) Somebody had like robbed Robbed us. Right, right. My son had came in from out of town and. Took his um, laptop, and you know, a kid without his laptop is non functional. <laughs> so we had to make that right immediately. Um, but yeah, that happened. And you know what? I refused to allow that to get me down. Like the whole family, they were, they were wanting to soak in, and I was like, Mm-mm, we can't do it. We just, I refuse yeah. to allow that situation to mess up our time together. So that happened, but I would not allow it to destroy the moments that we were having with the family, as well as the work that we were doing. Um, yeah, right? we were with filming. the documentary. We were filming. <laughs> and so, yeah. It's like, what a crazy thing to happen <laughs> while you're like, okay, we're going to get Airbnb because family's in town while we're filming and doing stuff. And then all of a sudden that happened. But yeah. Yeah, I'm so glad that no one was, you know, no one there. was harmed. Yeah. It was just some material things, you know. I think my my work laptop that I freaked out for a minute because everything is on there. Um, But after taking a deep breath, I was like, I can't spend any any energy on something that I can't get back. Like, I I just refuse to do it. Sure. Um, I had to learn that lesson, I think, a couple of years ago. (laughs) Um, Somebody stole, like, three of our vehicles out of our driveway, including my husband's work van. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. like a heist level. That's, that's like, like a heist. That's like Italian job level. Yeah. <laughs> like it was. And when that happened, my husband was so angry, um, really because they'd taken his mom's car and, and it's very sentimental to him. Mm. Out of, you know. Yeah, and sure. me, I was just like, Mm-mm, I'm not about to feel how this wants me to feel. This wants me to be angry. Yeah. And I'm not going to give in to this. So I literally was like, okay, it, 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 it's a car, it's gone, we'll replace it. 
And every all of my friends were calling. They were freaking out. They were like, Justice, what do y'all need? The the like the because we had you know like I need three vehicles <laughs> from our RJ in work. We had lots of stuff in it from like setting up for protests or events and stuff. And I was just like, everything is replaceable. We'll be fine. And we have been. Yeah. Yep. We've been fine. They never <laughs> caught the culprits for the never Airbnb. Caught or the culprits from the Airbnb, and that person was on camera. Um, and never found the cars that were taken from our driveway. Dang. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's just Kansas City. Kansas City. Just <laughs> things get taken. And never. Fu- that just goes into the like, abyss. It's it's just, like, I just know. I was like, okay. I just need you know. Just watch your property. Lock things up. But sometimes. I mean, that's still, you know, Yeah. I just, the person, the, whoever took it, you know, maybe they needed it more than we did. Um, I try to think it, uh, about it along the lines of that. My husband is the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> he's like but, taken. He's like, we're going to go. Like, hunt. Yeah, we, exactly. I, have a, I have a set of skills. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's like, let's take to the streets. I know where these holes are, where they hang out and chop cars down and sell cars and so yeah, we I, I just couldn't. I, I just can't let any anything take my energy like that. Sure. Because I have important work to do and there are too many people that depend on me and I need to be in my right mind. I don't need to be thinking about that, something I can't change. Um, I like to solve problems and if if I couldn't solve that, it's it's, it's done yeah. away. Let's solve it, we'll get another vehicle. How about that? We'll raise some money to replace things that, you know, we lost. And yeah. We'll, and we will be fine. And you'll be fine. Well, go and throw out your Venmo real quick. Maybe some people on the line will want to give you, give you a little donation yeah, yeah, to yeah. your, your vehicle. Venmo. Justice Gatson. Yeah, we never recovered any of that. Justice Gatson. J-U-S-T-I-C-E. Gatson. G-A-T-S-O-N. We appreciate all of the donations. Yeah, um, send, her, send her some money, people. Show her some love. <laughs> Start off 2023 right. Please. With some community support. Well... Yeah, I've always wondered, like, I know that Apple computers and stuff have that, like, find my laptop or whatever mm-hmm, feature. Mm-hmm. I didn't have an Apple. Right. Um, I had, oh, gosh, what, what lap, was it Microsoft? I think it was a Microsoft um, laptop. Um, but, yeah, I didn't, I don't have that but It's feature. like, what am I going to do? Am I going to go knock on their door? Like, my computer, it says yeah, on I my phone. I know you got it. I know you I got know it in here. there. <laughs> you open the door and give me back my stuff. <laughs> yeah. No, it's gone. Yeah, well, that's I'm cool okay that you're that. maintaining your energy and your spirit of joy. You yeah, know, and there are so many. I, 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 it only takes for me to think about um, the pe- some of the people that I know, some of the people that we serve, and how much they have lost for me to be like, it's nothing hmm. compared to what people are dealing with. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I want to jump into like the folks you serve and all that to do, but yeah. first let's 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 let the world know who is Justice who is Gadsett. Justice? Tell who us the mother, Justice? the legend, the the, <laughs> right. the 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 community advocate. Yeah, who are you? So Justice is a social justice doula. Um, justice is a mother of three. Um, Beautiful, beautiful souls. Great kids. Uh, it's fun to have them on wonderful. set when we were filming uh, your story. Aren't I, lucky? <laughs> aren't I lucky that they chose me to bring them into, <laughs> like, I really, really am. And I'm so thankful for for them. Um, I, gosh, I have a lot of roles in the community. I'm auntie to a lot of people. I'm an auntie in the social justice movement to a lot of people. I am a sister, I am a friend, I'm a sibling, um, but I also wear a lot of professional hats. Um, I serve as the co-vice president for the National Lawyers Guild for the Midwest region. Oh, wow. And so that's Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, Wisconsin. And you know, when there's a protest or something like George Floyd happens, though all of my states, so when that happened, all of my states were in an uproar, right? Sure, yeah. So... Along with that, um, I am the co-chair of the Reparations Coalition in Kansas City. I'm happy to be doing that work to bring local reparations to our city. And you were just at the, you were going to go to the mayor's yeah, office yeah. today. but it's for the legal review, uh, but it's on legal review, but I'm really happy that the mayor has submitted to us um, language that we approve. Um, and so we're really happy. I'm hoping that we can get this done in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we've been working at this for uh, over two years, 
And so uh, it's really exciting to for them, for the council to support HR 40 last year, and for us as a coalition to keep pushing, keep pushing for the council to say, okay, we're going to do something about local reparations in Kansas City. So that's huge. Um, Hopefully, that's more than just uh, renaming Paseo, then so <laughs> Casey yeah, Nichols any, any, Road. And that's, that's so funny because any time that I'm going to put work in on anything, it's going to be something of substance. I won't have anything to do with it if it's not. And mm. that's why I said the language was really important to me um, because reading through it, it's not fluff. And um, the commission that will be put in place, we're going to make sure that they are a dynamic team who can d really, really dig in and do the work. And no, we won't accept um, any kind of fluff. It sure. has to be something substantial. It has to be something meaningful and real. Not performative. Right, or not just, performative. Yeah. So, yeah, work. I'm there to kind of watch and make sure <laughs> that it isn't fluff and that um, we actually get something, like you said, meaningful that we need. Yeah, what's like the dream outcome once it, if like... <clears throat> You know, everyone agrees on the language, and so the dream outcome is that we um, establish a commission um, through the mayor, uh, through the mayor's office. Mm -hmm. The mayor will appoint um, the um, desired outcome is for a study, which they will be doing, and a proposal with the recommendations on how we are to distribute reparations in Kansas City. Wow. For us, it's not um, a thing of questioning, do we need reparations, should we give reparations? As we're at the point of, okay, let's look at how we can work this out. Sure. And let's look at how um, Kansas City has played a role in um, you know, the treatment of African Americans um, in slavery and mm -hmm. how the city has benefited um, and, and what kind of monetary value can we see in that? And, and really things that are outside of money mm -hmm. as well. So I'm looking at a, hopefully a package that has a combination of things. So really that's the desired goal here. And, you know, it's labor, um, but it's like the birth justice work and any work that we do. I'm a doula as well. Yeah. So, you know, trained professional there to assist birthing families while, um, mama is laboring and wow. uh, having the baby. So, how many w like births have you been a part of? Oh my gosh, dozens deliver? and dozens of births. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. you do one any like recently over the holidays? No, 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 you, no. You yeah, uh, uh, no. I will only accept um a, a somebody if I know that my schedule is if I know that I can give them what they need, and my schedule was too hectic to accept any births sure. that might have been happening at the end of the year. Right. Um, but yeah, throughout the year, or I might do an emergency. I might cover for another doula. Um, that could happen at any time. But all of my work is really mu very much like the laboring process. You know, the seed is there right from the very beginning. Um, and then you got to nurture that and you got to grow that. And then you got to birth that. And after you birth that, <laughs> you got to take care of that and make sure that. Um, you know, the baby can can stand and, and, and on its own. So processes. Processes. <laughs> t the, today, actually, earlier today, I was uh, doing some cleaning in my basement, kind of organizing. And uh, I was going through my baby box. My mom, mm -hmm. I re-inherited that recently. And I don't know why. It just kind of blew my mind. So I, I was born June 21st, okay. um, 1989. So that's on the summer solstice. I don't know if you're into the... Mm -hmm. zodiac <laughs> kind of know. stuff and uh so it's been a big debate as far as like i've been trying to like figure out if i'm a cancer or a gemini mm. and so apparently if i was born between midnight and 3 a.m i would be a gemini if i was born between 3 a.m and sunrise i'd be a cancer or something mm. uh, again it, there's all i don't know all that you know the moon and the, the lunar is a little i lighten. have friends who are Deeply involved in that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, oh, it's a cult following. Yeah. <laughs> it's a personality thing. Well, you're such an Aries. You're such a <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Maybe you got the best of both worlds and you got some of both of the Gemini. Well, that's how I, I identify. Yeah. Just like I just accept that I have the, I just take the best of what I like about yeah. both. 
But I actually, today was the first time, because on my birth certificate, I didn't have the time stamp when okay, I was born. Okay, so now you know the time. But then I found uh, one of the, like one of the hospital cards, and it said I was born at 4 a.m. So I'm like, well, I guess I'm a cancer. Yep, <laughs> yep. Like, Just Those like, times really do matter. Like, uh, people who do birth charts, they're like... I need to know that time. <laughs> right. It's important. I was, it was eating me for like <laughs> several years. I was like, cause I looked, I, I remember a few years ago digging for my birth certificate and I was like, they didn't put the time on this. Mm-mm. And I go through my baby box and it's just this little card. Just little. Yeah. My, my husband, my partner, um, he was adopted and he's really into the Zodiac. He like, he is deeply in it. And that's one thing that drives him crazy. He, he just does not know the time that he was born oh really like, yeah so we have the same <laughs> he didn't get that information so you found yours yeah and when you're adopted like back then they didn't give you all that information uh so he just doesn't know what time he was born uh, or else he'd have a birth chart done <laughs> <laughs> You just come home one day and he's figured it out. He's got all these. Every year. (laughs) Incense uh, burning. And he's just, he's like, I'm obsessed with it. Because every year, um, at the end of the year, he says, you know, we got to read our charts for like our predictions for the year. And okay. So I did this one year. We're sitting down, we're doing this, we're reading. And it says to me, oh, you know, you're expecting a child this year. And I busted out laughing because, you know, we had. Um, beyond Angelani already. I'm like, we're done. <laughs> and I'm like, this is like, this isn't true. Oh, wow. Well. A oh, couple months into the year. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> you know way. Guess what? That's how Junior got here. Oh, wow. That's. Yeah. So ever, ever since then, I was just like, okay, this thing is like, you know. The God and said it would, it would I happen. I was just like, I just use it to kind of help me with my day. Sure. You know, if it's telling me to look out for these things, you know, I'm just more perceptive and more on it than I normally would be. That That's how he uses it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, after that, I was just like, oh, goodness, the stars <laughs> do align and something <laughs> magical happens. <laughs> kind of parallel to that, do you do any, like, tarot reading or have you ever had your tarot? I haven't, but I have friends who do. I mean, in the especially in, like, in the birth, in the birth world space, you're going to find a lot of folks. You're going to find um, people who do all kinds of things like tarot readings, um, uh, all kinds of crystal gym type of things, green witchery things, <laughs> herbal things. I'm I was going to say, as a, doula, as a doula, yeah, I imagine that. <laughs> yeah. If people want to do things the natural way, I imagine. You, you, have you ever run into a situation where you're like, uh, yeah, no, to keep the place uh, sanitary, we can't have this uh, sage burning or I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 because actually sage burning isn't um, an issue at all. Okay. And say somebody's doing a home, except if you're in the hospital. Yeah. But if you're in a, at home and you're doing a home birth and say you're laboring in a pool and you want the doula to burn some sage and we can do that. that like that's no okay. problem at all. And that's actually the beauty of a home birth because you have more freedom. Say you were in a hospital, you're not going to burn sage. Yeah, they're like. <laughs> and uh, the thing, the, one of the big things is they don't want you to eat, right? You mm. can barely eat or drink. And as a doula, I know that a laboring person needs their energy. Yeah. And it's okay. It really is okay for them to eat and drink. There's like, mm. there's no medical reason why they can't eat or drink. It's uh, for whatever reason. The hospitals don't like it. And so, yeah, people who labor at home and they're laboring, they're eating, they're drinking when they want, they're getting up, they're using the peanut ball if we need to, they're using uh, birth stools. It's not natural for us to labor in bed. Hmm. It's not natural for the body to lie back to birth. Interesting. Um, yeah. The baby um, automatically is moving in a kind of in a downward motion and if you lie back on that, you know, mm-hmm. just imagine, uh, I, I'll say it as least graphic as possible <laughs> so the audience can get it, but just imagine that you have to use the bathroom. Yeah. And, you know, then you decide to sit on the toilet and then all of a sudden you're going to lay back. Right. No, that doesn't work, right? <laughs> we got to get things to come down and out, gotta right? use that gravity <laughs> yeah. assistance. It's a, another reason why, uh, you know, uh, Native Americans, Native folks will hug trees. Mm. And oh, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, hug yeah. the tree and squats. We're about to birth this baby, right? 
Right. <laughs> yeah, when the saber tooth tiger is over there, and the wolves are like, <laughs> "Your baby's coming." All right, let me just let me just hug this tree, get squats, this baby out. Uh, stools, um, because it really is unnatural mm. to labor and birth in a bed. It goes against everything your body wants to do. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that. I mean, yeah, no, you yeah, can only sense. know what you're taught. And sure. if you're a birthing person and you're j- pregnant for the first time and you're learning, like you don't know. So, you know, we lost a lot of uh, knowledge um, because of the capitalism that follows with the medical profession. Yeah. Um, and because also really the um, criminalization of black midwives yeah. um, in particular. Because even when the medical profession was like, okay, you know, come have your babies the factory style, um, usually black women were like, nah, you know, I mm-hmm. mean, trusting the um, medical systems anyway was already an issue, and you were talking about dealing with racism too. Right. <laughs> so we felt safer uh, to birth our babies at home, and we did with great care from midwives who were knowledgeable. And use herbs and all kinds of other things to help and assist with labor and delivery. Like we've been doing this way longer than hospitals have been in existence. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so wow. yeah, I'm, I'm a doula. Um, oh gosh, um, I'm forgetting a ton of things that I do. Um, but I think that most importantly, I'm a social justice doula. Yeah. And really, what that means is that. I've married the skills that I have as a birth professional, as a labor professional, Mm -hmm. uh, with organizing skills, because I think it's really important. The way that we approach the community is important. Uh, We have to make sure that we are conscious of all kinds of things, especially generational trauma, especially, um, you know, really look at a community through that lens. Mm. And when you apply the love, care, and skills that you do to a birthing family, right, to your community, yes, the results are amazing. And that's how we have to treat our community sometimes, like we're fragile, we're babes. We are coming out of this thing that we've been in. Um, A lot, you know, people don't like to acknowledge it, but racism and discrimination has so poisoned our communities. And so Mm -hmm. lots and lots of generational harm and trauma that we have to come up at in order to restore ourselves, to be healthy and whole, to grow our families. And so that's my heart's work, is to make sure that when I'm approaching my community, no matter what it is, that I'm thinking about how I care for a newborn. Yeah, I'm thinking about the kinds of things that I would do for um, for a a mama who just gave birth, or uh, a laboring person who needs me to be there. Hmm. Um, that's a lot of love and care and attention. Yeah, that's outside right. of what systems provide, and so yeah, that's why I have to remain emotionally available. I, I can't let the theft of the cars <laughs> in the driveway <laughs> ruin my day. I can't, can't let, let the Airbnb robbery just make me lay down and be like, oh, I I, I, I can't do that. Wow. Yeah, that takes um, just a real, I don't know, inner drive. And like you said, I think that's a powerful metaphor to think of this justice work as like nurturing and caring because – when we think of it as just like a mode of transactional, like, hey, we need these things, give it, and and like sometimes we do have to take it and be aggressive. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not saying nurturing has to be, <laughs> like you said, you just oh, described no, birthing. Know, sometimes and it's, we it's might very have aggressive. to go snatch a baby. Sometimes okay? we got to hug the tree <laughs> and we got to force <laughs> things out. Sometimes <laughs> we have to go and do and get our folks. We got to go do what we need to do. Absolutely. Um, And so we do that when we need to, but we recognize that we are generally and haven't been soft with ourselves because the world hasn't been soft with us. So I kiss my kids and hug on them and love on them so much because I know that the world that I bought them to isn't as loving as I am. Yeah. And, and I want them to know 
what it feels like to be loved so that they can then know how to love somebody else. We don't have to give into evil. We don't have to give into the nastiness of the world. We can be a light in it. And that's really what I want. Um, and I want people to see the light in themselves and not dim it. Yes. Yep. Um, would you mind sharing a little bit about kind of like, because like you talked about like the structural racism within the mm-hmm. medical field and I got to hear some of it and this can just, you don't have to rehash it all because like I said, yeah. everyone can watch Justice's uh, documentary coming out in March 2023 on docucourse.org. But just since we're kind of sharing about your doula and just mm-hmm. your, your life experience and this will probably tie in nicely with how you're working with mothers right now right. and the bail bonds. But if you don't mind just sharing a little bit about like, yeah, um, your journey with your kids, like just what you've had to endure to fight for that love yeah. <laughs> in the midst of a hateful oh, system. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So really Rural Justice Network was born out of my passion to support protective parents, um, parents who were um, fighting with their abuser in order to keep themselves and their children safe. And, um, you know, people think there is a lot of help out here for survivors, for people who are being abused. And they're just, it just isn't true. It just isn't what people think. Um, And the system itself isn't necessarily designed to support survivors um, in the way that they need. The system isn't even designed to um, support the facilitation of um, what I would call accountability um, with abusers. Hmm. Um, You know, I tend to think that, okay, you know, jail is the answer. And I'm here to say as a survivor, and a lot of survivors that I talk to, that jail to their abuser was likely not the answer. Um, It came to backfire on the survivor. And it never left um, anything, it never left the abuser in a way that they could... um, get through and work through why they were abusing. Um, I I wanna, you know, just remind people that oftentimes um, these are relationships, intimate partner relationships with people that we love and care about. And we don't want them hurt, harmed, we just want then the behavior to stop, and yeah. we want healthy, happy relationships. That's that's the goal. And so, in, uh, as a black woman in particular, I found it very difficult to engage with a system that I couldn't trust to deal with my situation. I couldn't trust the police to come and deal with him yeah. because I was afraid they might kill him. They might do something Mm. to him, and that isn't what I want. I want him restored. I want him healed. I want him whole. And even if it's not to be in a relationship with me, it's for the next person that he finds himself with so that he doesn't harm her. And the cycle continues and continues and continues. And, I, you know, it's a different way of thinking about it. Now, mo- uh, the majority of my support is for survivors because that's my lane. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to run, run with the survivors first. But I have compassion, love, and grace for abusers as well um, because I know that if they don't get the healing they need, the impact that they have on somebody else's life could be detrimental, it could end their life. And so it's important that we care about everybody in the situation. Absolutely. That's really hard to do, I imagine, in the moment. Yeah, it's hard to do in the moment, but 
it's it I would say that the dynamic of the relationship will depend on how hard what it's hard to do. Mm. If you love somebody that is hurting you, it's easier to want to see them get help. If you were abused by somebody you really didn't know, it's easier to I think want to see the criminal justice system deal with them. Right. And what I say, um, I think it's right for a survivor to determine how it is they need to see that happen, how they need to see that accountability happen. Is it through the criminal justice lens? Is it through counseling and getting therapy and getting help? Um, sometimes it's both. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, cage, just a cage for a person to be in without any real rehabilitative um, help is just not conducive to anybody at all. Um, but like I said, though, I, I'm talking about abusers, but really my, my heart is really with survivors and helping them through what they went through. Um, a and lot the, of survivors, go ahead. I was just going to say, and like you said, that in your specific situation, because he was, you know, a black male, your partner. Yeah. You knew that, like, hey, our interaction with the police, and this is, what, 20 years ago? Yeah. So it's like there weren't cell phones prominent. There weren't mm-hmm. things to hold. I mean, even now, police are impossible to hold accountable, with even with body cams and stuff. But it's a little bit better than even probably. Yeah, TV. it's a little bit better, I think. But it was. But you don't want to be in that situation. And you wanted. To not just, at all. You just wanted your kids. Like I just wanted, wanted my son. Yeah, you know. my, it was uh, my oldest son. Um, at, at the time, uh, and, <laughs> you know, and, and as I will say this, I never thought that I would be in a relationship like that. I was a tough girl from Kansas city. Mm-hmm. I grew up in six, four, one, three, oh, er, er, zip code, you know? And so I knew how to carry myself. I knew how to protect myself. Um, I was talented, um, smart. Um, I remember, you know, um, I had a radio show and I remember cutting a PSA for um, one of the domestic violence centers that's still around. And I remember after I cut this uh, PSA, public service announcement for the radio, um, I was laughing and talking with my friends about how like this is like this could never be me. This could Hmm. never, ever be me. Like, why doesn't she fight back? Why don't they leave? Why don't they like saying all the things that are wrong? Um, but I was ignorant, and I didn't know any better. Um, I didn't understand the dynamics and how they play um, until I actually went through it. And it was very, very eye-opening. And it's, um, it's so true that the moment you decide, okay, this is serious, I need to get out of this. So you're, you're in the most danger of your life, the most danger you could ever be in. Um, I ran. I got found. I ran again. <laughs> um, Did you, like, leave Kansas City? Uh, well, I was actually somewhere else. Oh. Yeah. And I came here. I came home. Um, I got followed. Um, and when it came to the point where, because I had a, a new partner in my life who – was very protective of me. Um, he couldn't physically do anything to me anymore, but he began to up his legal abuse, um, filing all kinds of things in court, trying to drag me into court for all kinds of custody and this and that and everything. And the thing with legal proceedings is that you have to answer. And so, you know, I was compelled a lot <laughs> yeah. before the court just so this guy could see me. Because, you know, um, I, I refused to speak to him other than to try to maintain a relationship with him and his child. And that's the other thing. As a black woman, I wanted desperately for my son to know and be in good relationship with his father. And I was willing to do everything to make that happen, even the detriment of my own peace and mm-hmm. safety. And I realized, I had to come to realize that that's not going to happen, you know? Um, And it didn't. He did things to endanger our son. He's very reckless. And um, those are some of the most trying times of my life. 
and I can look back now and reflect because of those experiences. I can help somebody who is going through it, I, or, you know, at the different stages and different levels, you see it, and I'm there to help and support somebody and to tell them that there's light on the other side of this. And actually, these are the things that I didn't know when it was happening to me that I can now tell you to help you out. So you maybe don't have to go through all the things that I went through. Um, my son was snatched from me when he was 13, you know, and I didn't see him for five years. Oh, wow. And during that time, he was abused, um, all the things that you don't want to happen to your child. And so. And he technically had legal yeah. custody, right? Yeah, yeah. He lied. Oh, goodness. He lied and he lied and he, there were missing, po there were, posters missing and exploited my son was on them um he made a false report to the missing and exploited kids network he went into a court in north carolina and got a judge to sign off to give him sole custody based on the you know the lies he told them and you know <laughs> i i'm just happy and glad that i'm Somewhat on the other side of this. I mean, my son is 22 now. But the impacts of what he went through affect him now as a young man. Um, I'm glad that he has the foresight to see that that's not how he wants to behave. And so he's taking measures to make sure that his attitude is in line and that his heart is right. Um, so that when the time comes, he can have a family that's happy, that's whole, and that he is, you know, being a good father and a good partner uh, when that, whenever that happens. But, yeah, uh, Mike, I, I really, really went through a lot. And it's, I think, my children have definitely been my strength, um, my family, my community. And I'm happy to be here to be able to support somebody else through it. What was it like when your son, I'm assuming he had to like, was it 18 that he reached back out to you when he was of legal so, age or whatever? Oh, so I'm, I'm going to tell, like, before this happened, <clears throat> I had been doing a lot of research. I've been in contact with a lot of different people to figure out how I can help myself, how I can help my son. And... <laughs> I was given information that I actually shared with my son. So before he was taken for like two years, uh, my partner and I were kind of prepping him because I told him that this could potentially happen. I, I was told that it could. And so um, we were giving him like ways to contact us and things like that. So we actually had some contact. Okay. Um, he found ways to communicate with me to let me know that he was okay. And when he turned 18, I was there. Um, <laughs> uh, he had gotten into the University of Charlotte through his high school program. And uh, they were going to have a graduation. So I was absolutely there. Um, mm -hmm. It was the first time I'd seen him in five years. Uh, I remember walking into the school and the security guard there saw my face and I immediately knew who I was. <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> but he walks up to me and he says, I know you don't know me, but I know your son. And I want to tell you that I have watched him over the last few years. And you have an amazing, an amazing young man. Hmm. He says, I've watched him make decisions around his peers and not give in to peer pressure. And he just talked about how uh, how polite, how respectful he, he is. All the thing a mama wants to hear about their child who they haven't seen in years. It was like everything that I taught <laughs> him how to be this guy was telling me, Mama, no worries. He was doing this even when you weren't around and nobody was here but peers. and uh, Like, even amongst his peers, he was like, no, nah, I'm not going to engage in that. Hmm. 
and he came became very respected amongst his peers and he hung out with who he is the geeks <laughs> <laughs> the smart kids that, that resonates with me yeah. yeah yeah the smart kids they were having uh they were in uh north carolina and i remember there was something that happened i think there was a shooting with a police officer and there was a lot of protests in the streets and i remember i was worried about my son and i called him i said hey are you out in the streets you know, because I know I would be, so I wasn't going to chastise him. Mm. <laughs> um, and he's like, no. He said, actually, I'm with my friends, and we're building a... I said, okay. Are they, what are y'all building? They were building something <laughs> together. I'm like, okay. So you all are going to spend hours and hours and hours doing that. That's fine. I just don't want you <laughs> getting hurt out it's in like, the street. Drugs are great, but have you ever <laughs> have you ever built a fort? Out of, yeah. out of <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember what they were building. They made a lot of things. They actually won some really prestigious award and their team got a lot of money for it. Really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. I can't. And, you know, Jelani is into um, mechanics and um, performance cars and things like that. So, yeah. Wow. Anything mechanical, anything in the engineering lane. My son is always taking things apart and putting them together and stuff like that. So, <laughs> yeah. well, it sounds like he uh, yeah. really soaked in all that goodness from you, despite the the distance and the separation that happened. Yeah, um, I, I mean, just as a mama to hear those words and then to go in and kind of see the friends that he's been hanging around and how all of his teachers and everybody just is like this is a great student i mean i was i was bad at school so <laughs> it made made me feel good really really good uh i was bad because i was bored <laughs> sure <laughs> yeah and i'm sure the education system is maybe a little bit better now again yeah. it's that whole i had to get to genesis and i'm hearing they're closing um Octo, my, my partner told me that my school that really helped me the most in this city is shutting down. Really? I hope that's not true. Hmm. Um, yeah, my mom pulled me out of Central Middle. She's like, you're not doing anything up here, but getting in trouble. Um, she put me in Genesis, and it's considered the bad school. It's the alternative school. Like, you don't want to go to Genesis. Hmm. And I didn't. I was like, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. <laughs> but I went, you know. Um and as for as much as I didn't want to go, when I got there, it was um, it was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. Really? Yes. Like, do you feel like there was just more structure or just like... It was less structure. Oh, less structure. Okay. Yeah. More freedom. More opportunities to voice and learn how to be a conscious thinker. As opposed to just believing everything anybody feeds me. Yeah, just memorizing facts Ab or something for the test. Allowing us to question and ask questions and be who we are. Um, my mentor was the program director. Her name is Mamie Isler. Beautiful woman. She would wear these African clothing and her head wrapped up. And we would just look at her like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I want to do like, I want to, I want to wrap my hair. I want to wear those clothes. And she would teach us about Africa. She would teach us about our history. And she would, she brought teachers in to educate us and to tell us about the history. Like I didn't know about the riots in Kansas City. I didn't know a lot of things yeah. that happened here. But our professors did. Some of them were a part of them. And she bought them in. She exposed us to them. I was already an avid reader. I would read anything. But introduced to her, she introduced me to books um, from, like, Angela Davis. Like, I, I read, I was like, I was 14. I read Women, Race, and Class. And I was, like, blown away. <laughs> wow. um, I read The Spook Who Sat By The Door. I was blown away. It was actually a movie that was banned here. Really? Because it's about the first black uh, FBI agent or CIA. It was either FBI or CIA. But anyway, he went into the agency and he learned everything. And he took what he learned back to the community hmm. and organized, I believe, street gangs. So 
it was, yeah, I, I was like, the spook who sat by the door is an amazing book. Like, oh, my God. So I'm learning about all these people. I'm learning about uh, Young, Gifted, and Black. I'm reading that book. I'm reading The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin. I'm reading books by Lorraine Hansberry. I'm, I'm, I'm reading um, Zora Neale Hurston. I'm deeply into poetry. I'm, 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 I'm losing my mind. <laughs> yeah. like, I'm staying up all night reading, reading, reading. And back then I was a little somewhat of a book thief, right? <laughs> I wouldn't take anything, but I would take your book. <laughs> and, yeah, and so I had a collection looking. of books. Let me snatch that book yeah. up real quick. <laughs> so um, I would say I didn't get that from anywhere else but Genesis. And the teachers there were very caring. Um, they didn't just want you to, like, they were concerned about you. And they were concerned about what happened in your community the night before. Mm. That's something that wasn't going on at Central. They probably had too many students to deal with. I, I, I don't know. But it was just different. They were investing they w- you. They were definitely yeah. investing in us. And so that's actually how I got into radio. Really? I went to... Um, they took us to, um, what do you call that? Field trip. <laughs> and we were going to the radio station. And this is when KPRS, KPRT was okay. down at Crown Center um, uh, above the the ice skating rink. Mm-hmm. So those of you who are listening to this and you remember those days, yeah, I was that say, was I haven't, that I haven't long ago. I haven't heard KPRT in a long time. KPRS, KPRT, they're still in existence. They, I listen to them all the time. So I went there and... I remember I was in a production room, very much like the one that I cut that PSA in, mm-hmm. and um, everybody was gone. But I was so like enthralled. I was like, "Yes, this is amazing!" So I just, I was just pretending like I was on the radio, and I had no idea that it was recording in there. And then later on, I was at the school, back at school, like a day or two later, they were looking for me. They were looking for who was that in the production room on the red who was that and it was me really so they said you've got a voice you've got something do you want to learn radio production and i was like i think i do so i went down there i'll never forget russ shaw thank you russ for trusting me for believing in me um he was like just do you want to learn these boards and i was like he said you think you can learn this i said yeah i could learn it and it took me like a week Really? And I learned it. I got it that down. Quick. I was so wow. good with it. Oh, I got my FCC license. I had a show at KPRS, KPRT. I got a show at K- KKFI. KKFI was like, you're good enough. Like, you can you check the big monitors, and, you know, sometimes we might have to dip out. You might be the only one in here, but you can handle it. They trusted me to do that, and I did. I was always in time. Um, I tell my husband now, like, you're the reason I'm late every, all the time because <laughs> before I met you, I had a radio job and I was always on time. <laughs> um, you got to be on time for radio, right? right. <laughs> you can't have dead air. And it was just um, an opportunity for actually for me to bring other young people like myself and give them a voice to speak to their community. We did a lot of poetry. Yeah. Lots of poetry on the radio, off the radio, all through the city. I would have to say that Poetry was like one of the real mechanisms that I used to speak to people, to get people to think Mm -hmm. about young people, to get people to care about what we cared about. And um, it has always been a source of of power for me. Yeah. I feel very powerful when I've got my poetry hat on. um, Uh, So the show was Kansas City Teen Talk. It's one of them. And then the other one was Genesis. Oh, wow. Kansas City Teen Talk. Because I was, uh, Genesis actually like, okay, they invested and bought, and like they equipped uh, one of the rooms with an entire studio, an entire production studio, so that all the students could learn radio production. See, I love that, 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 that train of, of actions of, your teacher investing in you, giving you these books, you know, and mm-hmm. opening up your brain, open up your mind, taking you to have that kind of experience. You see yourself doing it. You, you just, they, they see it in you. They invite, 
And then it goes right back into the school as far as like the next generation of kids getting yes. to test their hands at that. Like what a beautiful full circle experience to like Absolutely. how much our actions we don't think like for any teachers out there. I understand you're not paid well. It's a shit system. You're working uphill on all fronts. But when you take time to invest in kids like that and, you know, it, it means it, the world. You may not see that kind of return immediately, but that's beautiful that you were able to. Genesis saves so many of us, um, which is why I hope it's not going down, which is what I'm hearing. I think it might be another fight for me to pick up. Um, it was just an extraordinary experience. Now, um, they were like, well, you got a scholarship. You know, you can go to Notre Dame de Sion. Okay, so I'm <laughs> like, I don't know about Notre Dame. It's so white, uh, and, and, <laughs> and it's so far. Um, but I, I went to Notre Dame de Sion for six months, <laughs> and I'm like, uh-uh, no. Um, I was like one of three black students in the entire school. Really? Yeah. And I am I just didn't have what I needed there. Um, now, I know that maybe my religious religion teacher probably, you know, <laughs> didn't appreciate, you know. But I had fun in that class because I challenged her a lot. <laughs> sure. Um, As every religious teacher needs to be, <laughs> be and, challenged. And which which sparked kind of this thing in my peers in the class, especially my white peers, are like, she has a point. Is it true? <laughs> 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 and so when you've got, you know, Catholic girls <laughs> asking, is Jesus black? What do you what do you mean? <laughs> Jesus is black. Is, is you mean there are no like, white people in the Bible? I like there's bronze, y'all. Like <laughs> what color is bronze? And he's burnt. Like he's his hair's like burning like wool. Are y'all's hair like wool? And they're like, no. I'm like, come on. <laughs> y'all are smart. You're going to Notre Dame de Sion. Come on. <laughs> there are no white people in the Bible? <laughs> no. So, <laughs> so yeah, that was fun, but I had to leave. Um and then so I went to Bishop Hogan for the next six months, so other half of the year. And I loved Hogan, but it was, um, you know, it was a lot, it's co-ed, it was fun, fun. I was having a little bit too much fun, and um, I had another opportunity, and they were like, um, you know, you got a scholarship to go to St. Teresa's Academy, do you wanna go? So I landed at St. Teresa's. It's actually the place that I held my first protest Really? STA. Y'all can do it. St. <laughs> Teresa Academy students. Don't think you can't protest. I did it with a bunch of students over there. Yes. What was um, the protest? On? Uh, some ignorant student um, wrote a bunch of derogatory terms on stuff in the cafeteria, like spray painted derogatory terms. So I don't even have to say the words. You yeah. already know. And... Um, because St. Teresa's had more, so there were probably more like eight black students at St. Teresa's. So there's more, and there were more Latino students as well. And it was just a little bit better diversity. Mm. Um, as much as you can with <laughs> eight black students <laughs> and In the Catholic with school. hundreds <laughs> of white girls. But, um, yeah, and I got the nuns to agree with us, and we and we did it. Like, they supported us. I was thinking that they wouldn't support us, but they did, um, you know, <clears throat> words may be different from deeds, and at least in their words, <laughs> it says that we shouldn't act like this. And so the school was like, okay, yeah, we'll do this. So, yeah, I want to give a shout out to all my friends back at St. Teresa's Academy who helped us pull off our first protest. Um, I think it showed our other uh, students in the school, especially white students, that, you know, you can have a voice too. Um, you don't have to accept it. Absolutely. Just because maybe one of your peers does this, you don't have to go along with it. If you're offended by it, you can say so. And you can stand with with us when we when we speak on it too. So 
I look at it as a really, really positive experience. Um, I actually got to go to St. Teresa's a couple of years ago, talk to some of the students over there. They were going through, what was it? They had their, they're going through it about one of these movies. I can't remember which one it was. Is it the, the Hate You Give? I think it was the Hate You okay. Give. And I mentioned that I had a protest there, and there was a lot of perk up from students like, what, what, we need to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we need to do that again, right? <laughs> Yeah. 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 And that's, yeah. I mean, especially since, I mean, just the whole Black Lives Matter movement Mm -hmm. and I mean, universities have been, yeah, major hubs for just calling out all the systemic issues going on in their schools, not just the the hate crimes, everything that happened after Trump. I mean, right. Right. Like that was like, like when you're talking about the graffiti, that's what I mean. It came to mind. I was like, man, just the brazenness of people just going all over their campuses, spray painting and doing that shit. But just realizing like, yeah, hey, these policies, like the football teams, and the, just remember when all that, you know, and, yeah. and I'm sure it's still going on, but you just don't see as much on the news, and that's when... Yeah, you don't see it as much on the news, but it is definitely still going on. That's still a, a big issue. I, I see a lot of unfairness with the way that football is handled and how students aren't compensated. It's an exploitation. But the schools receive so much yeah. money. I actually have a case right now out of Fayette, Missouri, that I'm working on. We had two students there two um, football players, amazingly talented African-American football players, and they experienced two no-knock raids. Um, Horrible, horrible experience. uh, On the second one, they actually called me. It It was a Halloween night, and it was one of the most terrifying calls that I've ever been on. To hear these young men screaming and crying and afraid for their lives and uh christopher's girlfriend janice was there she literally she's a she's white they're both black she threw her body her physical body on them so that the police wouldn't shoot them really yes i from what i heard on the phone i was waiting i any minute i thought i was going to hear gunfire from the police so they were calling for like legal advice they were calling (coughs) for like Help us. This is happening again because we had already helped with the first raid. Um, They were holding Christopher for $50,000. And, um, you know, we were going to pay it. Um, I called up to the jail and I was, you know, just to double check and double check on things. And they were like, well, you know, that's cash. And I'm like, I'm aware. (laughs) And I think they looked me up because I called back and I'm to just get the correct amount of the bond just to make sure. They're like, oh, it's $4,000. Like, it went from 50000 to 4000 What happened? Mm. Was, did a judge, like, I don't think a judge did anything. I think that when I said, okay, I'm coming with 50, I think they looked me up and saw where I worked at and was like, mm, maybe we'll lower this. What were they trying to charge them with? Or what was oh. The, and I don't know if you can go um, into the details. Let me or. remember what they were trying to charge. Chris. Uh, 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 assault. Really? Yeah. But it was bullshit. It it? was it was BS. Christopher didn't assault this guy. He was this guy was assaulted, but not by Christopher. And Torrance, they dragged him into it because Torrance was very persistent on getting Christopher out of jail. And um, that's how they found me. And so we helped. And then because Torrance was a friend and was there and they seen they started um, uh, turning their attention to him. And that's what happened. They did the raid on him that night. He didn't do anything wrong. Um, Christopher, we went to court. We did a, um, it was Juneteenth. It was around Juneteenth. So we did a caravan to Fayette. Some of the folks from Kansas City, we drove down, went through the court case with them. Christopher completely exonerated. But the prosecutor in that case was embarrassed by the amount of law enforcement that she called out from other agencies. She had to answer for that. And so without a conviction of anybody, it's going to make her look really bad. So they did not want to let Torrance go. And they did, and they kept holding it and holding it. Um, And eventually, well, the most saddest part out of all of this is that a couple months ago, Torrance was killed. Really? In Fayette. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Um, Do we know what the circumstances was or... Well, <clears throat> it, it was a, a a non-student who was living in the house who shouldn't have been there. And so there's just some things around this that 
seem fuzzy to me. Um, the prosecutor who um, was trying to prosecute Torrance is the prosecutor for this guy. Complete uh, conflict of interest. The his parents uh, went just this this week um, for no last week. I'm sorry, last week, um, and they told me that it appears that the prosecutor isn't on their side or with them or going to help in the, in the way that she could and should. Nuts. And so uh, for me, um, as a professional, if I was that close to something, I would recuse myself sure, completely and get, remove myself completely out of it. But the family told me, they were like, you know, just as she bought up the case she bought up how you all came and protested her. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, we did. Mm. Um, but the fact that she bought it up seems to me that it's sore spot for her. Um, and the fact that they could never get Torrance, they even dropped it down to like a ticket. They were like, just pay a ticket. And he wouldn't do it. He would call me. He was like, Miss Justice, what should I do? And I said, well, Torrance, sweetie, I'm like, I'm, I feel like you're a son to me and treat you like I would Jelani. If you didn't do a thing, you don't ever cop to something you didn't do. Oh, that's you hold your head high, and you maintain your innocence. I said, because you didn't do it right. And he was like, no, ma'am. I did not do it. And I said, well, we got you. Uh, we were getting ready to go be with him for his game. Uh, we know the Chiefs looked at him. Some other folks were looking at him. And uh, we were getting ready to do some legal work to kind of get some accountability from the from Howard County who held him illegally and, and you know did all of those things violated them violated the constitutional rights um Ock and I went to Texas uh for a conference and that's when we got the call cuz we were going to come back and go see him uh Christopher called first Janice called Christopher called and I said something's up <laughs> they're calling answer Christopher and he was just like Miss Justice Torrance is dead, and I just lost it. Oh my gosh! And Ock, who is very fond of Torrance, Torrance is a big black guy. You know, Ock is a big black guy. That you know, Ock played football, and he remembers like just just they just had a lot in common. They would play around a lot, and I just saw my husband just shrink. Um, we canceled our plans for whatever we were going to do, and we went to the service, and we stayed in Memphis because that's where he was from um, to be with his family and to offer them support. His mother had no idea of what he went through. Really? She didn't know. She was like, when I told I said, I know you didn't know because I always wanted to talk to you. I said, as a mama, I would tell Torrance. I was like, look, I'm a mama boy. <laughs> and I would want to know if my son was going through this. I said, let me talk to your mom. And he said, no, Miss Justice. He's like, I don't want to disturb our peace. I don't want her worried about me. And he's, he's, shake, he's a shake. He's like, this is lightweight. This is lightweight. <laughs> we got this, Miss Justice. This is lightweight. <laughs> and that's the beauty of him. He was mature. He, he, he was very mature. Yeah. I mean, the guys in the house, he would keep them together. Like, he was the one. He was the one that they voted to be the team captain. So he had to have the respect of his peers for that to happen. Um, but he always had his head on straight, and he was like, you know, football ain't it for me. And I'm like, what you going to do? He was like, I'm going to open a business. He was like, we need – like some nice clothes for big guys like me. I like to look nice. I like to dress nice. And that's what he talked about. He was going to open a, sh uh, a clothing store for big guys to dress nice. He was going to use his business degree to get that because that's what he was getting. And he was going to go to the league. Hmm. Yep. And he would say, i never forget how much y'all are helping me. I thank y'all so much. Uh, I remember I took um, some uh, Lamar's donuts. I, mean, I got two dozen donuts, <laughs> and I got a whole big old Gates platter and drove to Fayette. 
with me and my kids and Ak, and we just sat with them for hours and just talked and talked. And they were like, we always heard about these donuts. We always heard about them. Oh, they're the best, yeah. <laughs> and so they devoured those donuts. <laughs> and then they had the barbecue, and they were just so happy. And they were so respectful. Um, young men who could be my sons. They are so big and tall and lovable. I, I, you know, and the fact that Torrance is gone tears me up. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, cause he had a light. He was gonna do something like a, yeah, beyond making money and playing ball. He had a light. He was gonna touch somebody. And he grew up, you know, Memphis was tougher than that's why he was in Missouri. Because I was like, we were, sca- we, were, we were scared for him. You know, Christopher had left because his girlfriend Janice got pregnant. And he was like, I can't be here with her pregnant. We don't know what will happen. You know, they were already getting a lot of hate. And so they left the area. But Torrance was like, Miss Justice, these people ain't going to run me away from my scholarship from my education, from my future. And I was like, okay. And I was like, yeah, but driving up through here is real eerie. Yeah. Because <laughs> when you come in, you feel, <clears throat> you feel the thickness of what you're about to get into. It's undeniable. Where is it? Howard County? Like, is it? Fayette, a, Missouri. It's probably like. I'm just trying power. to picture where this is at. I'm so bad with that. Ock knows better than me because I'm always in the passenger side. <laughs> That's what I was like. Is it between here and Columbia or is it like, yeah, I just didn't know which part of the state I want to say that, but I could be wrong. <laughs> well, it sounds like, yeah, unfortunately. But yeah, the st- you know, and so what I'll say is he recognized what was happening to them as mm-hmm. ball players and how the school was getting a lot of money and attention from them being there and how just how things were. And that was something else that, you know, we were going to address later on once we got through that part of that, of, of you know, of the criminal stuff that they were trying to put on them. Um, but, th- you know, I will say that that uh, that is our participatory defense work. Yeah. So that fell into our participatory defense lane, which Ock is leads, but I definitely support and help with a lot um and so we have cases like that all around missouri where we're supporting people through their court cases we have several right now Um, so it's always a big deal you know for the judges to know whether you do have community support or not uh there was (laughs) there's a guy they really shouldn't hold him but he was on like a a million dollar bond Really? Uh, immigration. So they do immigration bonds horrible. <coughs> and uh, in the court, the judge was like, well, he has no community. I'm not going to give him, like, I'm not going to reduce this. And um, we all showed up at the next court hearing. It's like, last week the judge said that he has no community. We want the judge to know he has community. Wow. And um, a day later, the judge reduced the bond, and we were able to get him out oh hell yeah yeah so uh, i know like yeah like especially when the kansas city protests were going on there mm-hmm. was this huge push to kind of get folks to donate to th- to the the bailout work mm-hmm. so before that <coughs> like you know and i know that it's these cases that you're taking but like mm-hmm. how did you <laughs> manage to help those folks who are protesting and so for the George Floyd protests that happened, there were um, Operation Liberation is another bail fund. Um, Don and Nikki, Don and Nikki run that. Um, they are siblings. Uh, we love them. They do amazing work, and so they were helping with a lot of that. Uh, we were helping with some bail. I was also in a tricky position, being that I'm in the guild, and. Mm. What we were doing is uh, making sure that legal observers are available mm-hmm. um, should protesters request them to come out. So I was making sure that all the folks who lead protests know that we over here, 
We can come out, we can observe these police actions. Um, for people who don't know, a legal observer is a trained professional and their only job is to document police behavior. They're not there to stop a protest. They're not there to stop anything. They're not even there to watch protesters. They're there to watch police, mm -hmm. to make sure that they're not violating our rights, right? Um, and so we did get, um, you know, information from that. Um, you know, I will say that it was somewhat disappointing that time. Uh, there were people popping up who had no good intentions, um, being loud and proud about it. Um, and basically um, taking over a moment for themselves. Mm. Um, like specific, like pro some protesters? No, I would say uh, oh. lawyers. Oh, the lawyers. Oh, I, I see. would say one lawyer in particular. Um, and just really uh, guiding protesters wrong. Hmm. There's somebody who wasn't really knowledgeable about civil rights law. Somebody who took a bunch of cases and then cried about it. Um, I might say her name. Uh, um, I don't need any legal I'm trouble here. On the no, <laughs> oh, there would be no legal trouble. <laughs> there would be no legal like, trouble, but I, I won't do that to you. We could slam or the, her. Uh, the, big, um, the big dogs out there in the world. I was like, oh, lawyers. I, I was like, Ooh. no, no. <laughs> but what I, what I will say is that for attorneys, if you don't have the skill or the wherewithal to do that work, you definitely shouldn't take cases because it's somebody's life at the end of that case that you're going to impact and your people call us when you don't do right by them. Hmm. So do right by them and I won't hear about it. How many folks roughly do you uh, like oh were arrested? Like I know that I, I witnessed. I was there. I saw people getting arrested and stuff. I just didn't know, like, if you you and other I organizations really try to. I don't remember the number. I would probably. Dozens. I could get the number and let yeah. you know, but I like off the top of my head, I don't remember. Remember that time, everybody was on fire. I was talking to people all across the country. Oh yeah, we were there the days, and mm -hmm. I remember I I went and I had my gas mask, and I was for out me. There just... It wasn't about Real Justice Network being in the streets. I felt like we've been there. Yeah. And these young people, we want them to be here. We want them to be in the movement. So this is their moment. Right. For them. I could have taken the mic. I could have done stuff, but I wanted to be a supportive role. So we really built out protest support during that time. Um, and letting you did like a... Uh Something with one of the victims of who'd been killed by the police. I remember you guys had an event where during that time you guys met. Maybe it wasn't you. I thought it was. Was it um, Mike? Not Mike. Um, Ryan Stokes. Yes, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, like with the family, and you kind of yes. did a thing, kind of. And I think that's like what you're saying. Like I, I think yes, I understand. It was George Floyd that kind of sparked this national outcry mm -hmm. against. Like, you know, I know so many people in my family or friends and people who were. You know, I don't know if on the fence is the right word, but just like it was the first time they kind of came to grips with, OK, maybe there's an issue with police brutality. Well, in when our it's nation. not <clears throat> in your lane, so to speak, and you don't have to interact with it or deal with it, right. it's hard to know. <clears throat> um, it's just a different experience that some a lot of black <clears throat> and brown people in this country have that's different. Um, and the years prior, it was just, yeah, a lot of victim blaming. Well. Mike Brown, you know, they said he mm -hmm. tried to pull, you know, they thought he had a gun or, you know, and he had robbed a store beforehand. It's like, mm -hmm. did that mean he that deserved to die? Right. No. And that like, doesn't mean he deserved to die. But it's just so funny <coughs> to me about this gun in hand situation when, you know, they will bring white folks in who <coughs> kill people in churches and, you know, shoot up the, all kinds. Take, take them to Burger King. Get Burger King. Yeah. And, you know, it's just um, definitely a difference in treatment and this is something that i talk about a lot i know our city officials don't want to hear it but our police they have an attitude problem um when it comes to black community and can be very aggressive mm -hmm. and disrespectful and <laughs> them being a public servant i expect better from them i don't expect them to have an aggressive behavior i well, I guess I should. Let me 
let me take that back. Knowing what I know about policing and the origins of policing, mm -hmm. yes, I do expect that. Um, and but they are want to be shown in, in a different light. I think they need to do the work to make themselves be who they want to be. They aren't there yet. Um, they aren't the protectors in my community that they say that they are. Um, as a matter of fact, it's really a big reason why I do the work that I do for survivors who will not ever call the police, right. but definitely need support and help. And we help a lot of people in our community. They call them like, Justice, I do not want the cops involved, but this is what's going on, and I need help. And the reason usually they don't want the cops involved is from what I said earlier. They don't want that person, that loved one, that family member to be harmed. They really do just want help mm -hmm. and not harm. A and they don't know what they'll open up by entering into a system that they don't trust already. Sure. So <coughs> we got work to do. Um, there are a lot of people who are falling through the cracks and through the gaps because they will never go to a police. They will not do it. Um, you know, I, I think it's really important to note that our organization is a reproductive justice uh, organization that is survivor led. So all of our leadership have either experienced sexual violence, intimate partner violence, domestic violence, or state violence. Um, and what I mean by state violence is a situation like Ryan Stokes. Mm -hmm. um, and so a family, right? Or um, a situation like Child Protective Services. Um, you know, m this mandatory reporting thing is out of hand. Um, you get Children's Mercy, I'm gonna say y'all's name, because y'all <laughs> deserve it. <laughs> calling on oh my gosh you go in there to take care of your child they'll hotline you that's crazy and that's the that's the systemic racism in the hospital <laughs> yeah. system is uh, you, know, uh, you know and so there's an organ an agency coming into your home you're death scared you don't know what to do i do a lot of know your rights for parents um like what are my rights right now do i have to open my door do i have to do this we'd also do a know, know your rights for dealing with law enforcement that's a big lane that I play with National Lawyers Guild. So even teaching that, I teach it differently to my black kids, because mm. they be, cause you know, other than it's like, yeah, you can take your phone out, and you can record cops. I'm like, look, if you take your phone out and you record cops, this is where I want you to place your phone. I want it right here. I don't want it to be misconstrued. Down near the stomach. Yes, as mm. a weapon that you just pull that's just in your hand, they don't know. To me, this is the safest position. I have to tell them different things than I do my white kids. Yeah. Because it is the way things are. My white kids can get snappy with the police. And they got more freedom to do that. Right. As soon as one of my black kids do, they might be face down in some glass or on the pavement. I literally watched that at the Kansas City protest. I was on the plaza, and I'm watching some white kids behind me chucking water bottles over the crowd. Mm-hmm. Next thing you know, here comes a hail of tear gas, and I'm watching cops pull black kids yep. out of the front. And it's like, yo, like I get that we're angry, but I'm like, you are literally, so <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole other level of privilege, right? Like I can yeah. protest, and I can antagonize the police, and it's the people in the front who are going to be <laughs> criminalized, and they were black folks, you know. And, you know, I know <laughs> watching some, of, uh, some things happen was truly painful. Um, there's ways to position yourselves in in this in out in the protest to make sure that Black and Indigenous folks are more safe or taken care of more safely. But I know folks didn't know those things here. Right. They didn't have those trainings, that education to know. There's a way. There are ways you can link up actually and protect each other. There are ways the whole crowd can be together and protect each other, and you all kind of you know go with the police but here's the other thing i always tell white folks when they're getting angry especially when we're out in a protest we're like you're not mattering than me so pipe down hmm. pipe down you're not mattering than me so if we say don't throw water bottles don't throw no water bottles right if we say don't do this don't do that if you can't respect us you're putting us in danger and we're going to ask you to leave hmm. because right now we don't need danger from the folks who are supposed to be here with us while we're facing it 
Absolutely. And so, you know, those folks who are more privileged, and if they're there for us, they will do that. <laughs> I remember I was uh, in St. Louis at a protest, and <laughs> I think, was it the Stockley protest? Yeah, I've been so many. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember white folks were gathering together, and they were like, we're going to Ferguson. Um, to, <laughs> to settle the score from from the Ferguson sure. stuff, and I remember them being approached, and they were like, "Did black people tell you to go to Ferguson?" And they were like, "No, they didn't." And they were like, "Well, you." And they were like, "Well, we won't go to Ferguson." Thank you, <laughs> thank you, because please. we don't need y'all. We don't need more to bodies. go to Ferguson. Do what you did there, did down here, because here was the issue: they went downtown, a um, bunch of white kids, Antifa. And um, bust all the glass downtown St. Louis. Like, I went down there to my office at the time. I was working for the ACLU of Missouri. So I was going to the office to get some gas masks because they were gassing everybody. And nobody had any more in nine masks. Mm -hmm. And I knew we had a lot in the office. So I was going to go get them. And when I went down there, everything, everything. So they went down there and bust everything up. And But they blamed it the next day on the black um, protesters. Of course they would. And it just, it, it just did not have, they did not do that. Yeah, it was, uh, St. Louis was pretty scary. They had bike cops out. They had loads up. They had cops in buses. Uh, <laughs> bringing, they had cops from different counties. It was very police heavy and very violent and not on the part of the protesters. I got caught up. We got caught. We almost got caught up in a kettle, but thank God we didn't. That's where they like tried to push. That's where a they grobe. trap you. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's we where saw I heard it about forming, that. and so we saw it forming, and we tried to. We were going to go warn everybody that we knew to come on out, and 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 leave because it was bound. It was going to happen. They kept inching, inching, and we got to the point where we couldn't go anymore because we were like, if we go, we're going to be stuck. They got um, this guy who um, had come out with his dog, his wife. He was living downtown. He didn't know nothing going on. He's going for a walk. They get him. They brutalize him. They mace him. Oh, my God. He, he's burning. He gets in jail. He goes to jail with everybody else. The people from the protest, they're taking care of him because he don't have anything for his eyes. Everybody has all their stuff because we knew it would happen. And later on, they find out. So the government starts looking for this guy. This guy is somebody to the government. He's a special guy to the government. He has a special security clearance. And he didn't report to work when he was supposed to. And they are looking for him. So, yeah, they picked somebody up that they should have never picked up. And so there was a lawsuit. Um, he wow. won and everything. But they damaged him for life. Sure. Yeah, that's that, the thing with us. What I mean is, no, he could not do his job. They harmed him physically. Oh, my God. He has nerve damage. So we had to bring in a doctor to talk about the amount of trauma that they caused him. He can't do his job anymore. That was one instance. One instance. There's lots and lots and lots of them. And I've seen where... Um, Black folks are definitely, when we were at the Galleria in St. Louis, they pass, they bypassed all the white kids who did the dirt and grabbed black kids. I mean, so, you know, and in those moments when we're together, that's when some white, our white siblings, they see, they're like, oh my goodness. Sometimes for the first time. Right. And they're like enraged. And then, then they start, begin to try to, deal with that anger and a lot of emotion happens out there but those are the things that help us later go back when we debrief and we process and we talk and mm. people begin to gain a deeper understanding of what life is like for people who have dark skin absolutely as, as opposed to people who have fair skin so that's a very like yeah fair thing to ask and I think like you're saying like we got to hold each other accountable and do it like in a strategic way and I understand like like we're like your anger is justified 
but not at the expense of harming the folks that you're here to try or the movement. To stand. Yeah, for the movement. me, for us, right. like those of us who's been in this, like we've been strategizing for years. Yeah. So like even some of the campaign things that come down that folks who got awakened in the George Floyd moment, they started repeating things that we've been talking about, like defund and um, breathe, and, like all these things. And they don't know, they don't know that organizers have been working on that for years. Mm. And so, and then they learn. Yeah. Because if you're around me, that's one thing I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure that you know and <laughs> have history and you understand what's going on. You understand relationships and, you know, the deeper dynamics of organizing. Um, that most people just like, oh, I'm just joining, but I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna take the mic. I'm gonna. That happens a lot in the repro space. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, no, no, no. Like, <laughs> sweep the floor. Like, no, come in, sweep the floor. Make yeah, everyone some wants coffee. to be part of the movement, but they don't want to do the dishes. That's yeah, what we used to have it. Let's <laughs> sign about that. It's like no one wants to do. Start there, because when you grab the mic and you start speaking you may send a message that we don't want out there. And you're centering yourself. And you're centering yourself mm -hmm. and you're saying things that we've moved from, like people were going back to the coat hanger thing. And we were like, we, as a movement, have moved away from, but because you haven't been a part of the movement and this thing that just happened with Roe has got you all out of sorts, you go back to what you remember. But your memory is what, 20 years ago, 10 <laughs> years ago? Yeah. Language has changed. Ideas, theories, we don't use the coat hanger. Why? Because things, healthcare is safer now than it ever has been. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to use that imagery so that our enemies who are not with us can further use that to evoke emotion out of people in order to get them to side with them. Yeah. Um, and so it's strategy. I have to tell people all the time, well, just this is another, no, actually it is harmful. It's harmful because we came together in a movement space and this is our work. And you're coming in now and you're telling us that what we've set up isn't because you want to be out there. So I don't know. Um, I just don't, uh, especially with um, birth work, with repro, um, the amount of trauma that black bodies have experienced, we are experts at this. And so um, I, I want white siblings especially, and this is a mandate now, white siblings, in case you don't know. <laughs> we went to the Let's Talk About Sex conference in Dallas. Sister Song, if you're not familiar with Sister Song, Google Sister Song, read all about them. Sister Song is the mothership of repro work. Hmm. They are the ones to make sure we had a term to describe what it is we want. And we need more than rights. We need more than rights. That was the thing, you know. Our white siblings, feminists, were like, we need rights, rights, rights. And we were like, yeah, we need access to those rights. Hmm. What's a right with no access? Hmm. Furthermore, do not dismiss the intersections, right? Because we're talking about, well, maybe, we're talking maybe we're talking about birth, maybe we're talking about choice. Um, but if I'm in the streets because the system has taken a young one. Uh, uh, join me. Right. Join me because this is important too. And that's one of the things that we really couldn't, over the years, couldn't get white feminist allies to understand that we aren't a one issue folk. Right. We have multiple issues. And we need your voice and support on all of them. We'll get down with you on the choice. We will. We'll rock with you hard. We will be there. Right. But don't abandon us when we say black lives matter. Mm. Because they do. Yeah, don't just go back to your, you know, brunch time liberalism yeah. where Biden's in office and we can just sit back and meanwhile, states, states are... are they're ramping up. We're seeing it and vo with right. voter suppression, with everything going on. It's the most critical time to be involved in activism work. And it's more than just the moment you show up for protests. It's how you show up in the long run for the movement. The The protest is not the work. <clears throat> the, when I come to a protest, just so y'all know, 
I'm I'm there to be in community and to get some aggression off. I'm not mm-hmm. there working. Sure. The work happens outside of the protest when we're all together, when we're strategizing, when we're coming up with documents and plans and doing if people want to get engaged in that talk to us. We want you to be involved in that, but I really want people to know it ain't about taking over the streets all the time. Sure. Not all the time. Sometimes yes. Yes, yes, sometimes. Especially if you do it in the plaza and you take over a whole oh, yeah. four-way trap. That yeah, was that's, a that's weird, <laughs> that was, I remember that being very, like, just growing up and just having this idea of what the plaza, like, <laughs> the, the pristine, clean, you know, whatever, and just seeing just the, the chaos of it was kind of a, a moment I'll never forget, for sure. Um, one last question, um, uh, you know, and as, you know, the show's called Pray for Micah Pod, i right. uh I, I still have, um, a faith that seeks out the divine and spirituality in these Mm -hmm. kind of moments and the, in moments with you, with people that, um, I connect with, um, over these issues and we see the inherent divinity and and love that we have for each other and Mm -hmm. our stories and our connection in this moment in time. And as I know, like in this kind of work, it's it's grueling and it's tough and we need some kind of anchor. Um, it could be a spiritual anchor. It could be just um, personal convictions. But I just want to hear like what what keeps you grounded in doing this daily work and supporting mothers, supporting victims of domestic violence for folks who are police brutality. I mean, just everything you're doing. Mm-hmm. Do you ever feel like it's hard to maintain or is it even more so critical to have this spiritual connection to see beyond the hurt and pain that you experience all the time? Uh, For me, it's it's critical to have a spiritual connection. Um, You know, (laughs) it's it's funny because I, um, I know my mother wanted me to probably preach <laughs> yeah my family did too uh, okay. <laughs> this and, is our church sir. Uh, yes we're, we're both preaching. So this is, we we have church i tell i have church all the time <laughs> um and um in the work itself i want i want people to understand that there is not a disconnect between spirituality and social justice hmm and you may dismiss the connection or ignore it or maybe you haven't seen it yet um but it's very clear to me and there have been moments where i have run i guess from the calling (laughs) in a sense um but it always comes for me um and i was telling my friends at blue um, black lives of uu that it was time for me to universalist Unitarians, so a spiritual group, uh, that it was really time for me to pay more attention to that voice, to that call, um, and that I realized that one of the things that I have been doing is busying myself with the work so much so that I don't have to pay attention. Mm. But that actually doesn't work. It's so, it's everywhere. It's so, so I, I'm, I, I was um, at state prison um, not too long ago for the execution of uh, KJ. So Missouri put. So the first transgender? No, no, no. Oh, no, no sorry. No. So KJ, uh, Kevin Johnson. Oh, okay. And, um, Kevin was rehabilitated. He murdered a police officer when he was 18, 19, something like that. Uh, Out of this extraordinary circumstance of seeing his 12-year-old brother not been given medical attention and aid by these police, and he died. So the same day his little brother died, he ended up taking the life of one of the police officers who was there. Wow. So... He's 18, 19, and um, years and years later, years and years later, here he is, uh, been in prison all this time, 
been a role model in prison, um, completely remorseful for his actions from day one, uh, honestly. And the state put him to death. When did this happen? Like, when was he... So, this happened. I was trying to give you a date. This was, <coughs> I want to say, November. Just, I get a... So much has been happening. Like, like just uh, recently? Just recently. Yeah. Oh, just recently. You can... I can look, look it up real yeah, quick. Yeah, you can look it up real quick. Um, we, we actually went to the governor's mansion and um, blocked the gate. Um to protest yeah, November and then, 29th yeah 2022 we uh, we um 37 years old real justice network we actually um got a bus from st louis so i chartered a bus folks from st louis to come and kansas city folks drove so first thing we did we went to the governor's mansion and tried to block the door like because for me it was you're gonna kill a man today Right. There will not be business as usual. You're not just going to go in and out these gates and everything's okay. We're here. And we want you to know how we feel about it. And you're the only person who can stop this. It's and you are the only person who can show some compassion and stop this. So you want to put to death a rehabilitated person. And so uh, we we left there. We ended up at the prison and um, the the execution was supposed to be at six. Six came, six fifteen, six thirty. His daughter is there. Now my she's nineteen, and they wouldn't allow her to be in there because she's too young. But they could decide really? to put him to death at the same age she is now. It's just the system is just horrible. But we were waiting, and everything about what was happening seemed unusual. And um, I was standing with Michelle, Pastor Michelle, from St. John's in St. Louis. And there was another woman who was praying. And we hadn't heard, so I came back to them, and I said, we haven't heard. And we started praying. We started praying. We just started praying all together. And then out of nowhere, this wind came. And it blew through us, almost knocked us over. And it went through the prison yard, and it was just on something. And then the guard came and told us, that it was done. And I believe wow. with all of my heart that that was KJ coming through. I was the last person to leave. Don and I were the last person t- people to leave the prison yard. The wind kept coming. It, it hadn't done that all night. It kept coming. It kept, and I said, I know. I know this is KJ talking to us. Those moments I hold on to is an energy that comes with that that I can't describe or explain, but I know I feel it. And I hold that so that when I have tough moments, I go back and I say, KJ is an ancestor now. Hmm. He's a powerful ancestor. Here to guide us. So the state took them, but we have them. We are spiritual beings having a human experience here. Hmm. We oftentimes think it's the other way. Right. And um, there's light in everybody. There's light in everybody. And we need to get to the light and shine our brightest that we can so that others can see your light. When I see your light, it makes my light illuminate more, Hmm. right? And when we see our siblings' light and they see us, we help sharpen each other. Absolutely. And community. (coughs) So for me, it's community. 
I need community to help sharpen and to be in space like that. But I also have times of reflection that's private, that's quiet, that's meditative, where I'm praying, where I'm thinking, where I'm struggling, maybe, sometimes. Or sometimes when I'm just in a posture of gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you so much. You know? Yeah. Who am I thanking? Thanking who we perceive to be God. Yeah. I'm thanking the universe. I'm thanking the earth for what it provides. Yeah. Everything that's <laughs> held together, wh- whatever that substance is, you know? And like mm-hmm. you said, I think that's, I don't know, it's like kind of one of those weird things where like, you know, uh, I used to, uh, for a moment I stopped praying over my meals because it was just kind of like, <laughs> I don't it's know. It's a ritual, I, I, <laughs> But sometimes I'll stop with friends and I'll just hold hands and we'll just, I'll just be like, you know, thank you for being here. Thanks for sharing this food right. with me. And just like that moment of just stopping to give gratitude to be alive and yeah. share a moment. That's prayer. That is. That is prayerful. And I'm, oh my gosh, I would say I'm always thinking, I'm always praying in my head. I'm always talking to the ancestors. My mentor, Mamie, we conversate. Um, you know, I believe in altars. We have altars in our space uh, where we pay respect and reverence to those who have passed on. Um, but I also believe in energy and healing powers of, you know, gems, um, also of herbs mm. as well. Um, things were given to us, nature gave us what we need. And so there is a tea somewhere that can calm you, right? Mm -hmm. Let's drink that tea. (laughs) Let's drink that tea. Maybe it's some chamomile tea. (laughs) Who knows? Maybe we need a little oat straw. Uh, Maybe somebody needs some nettle. Mm-hmm. To get your strength up, if you're uh, starting depleted. to sound like witch's brew to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just, okay, uh, no, just but, but yeah, you know, how many these times? These are the things that come from the earth that grow in the ground uh-huh. that have been using used for centuries to heal us. Absolutely. And even the medicine that you get from the pharmacy was once a plant that some science company broke down to get the medicinal property from and then added a bunch of fillers. Mm-hmm. What if you just had the plant no filler? Hmm. Hmm. Well, how would Big Pharma <laughs> make their money, Justice? How would Big Pharma? I don't know. They might have to do, they might have to think <laughs> about that. Um, you know, but and I was just going to, one last thing, I was just thinking about KJ and just having that moment of thinking about family and stuff. Like, I remember reading a quote one time, like, you know, he who has no sin like inject the first injection. Right. And it was a whole take on that scripture where Jesus is defending somebody. And, and it's just like, it's just amazing to me how much Christians, uh, you know, and I can critique that group just because I, that's where I'm from. That's Mm -hmm. like the spiritual like past I had. And like, I know there's good Christians, so I'm not, I'm not shitting on all of them and saying they're bad people, but I can be critical, extra critical of it because I know Mm -hmm. the shortcomings of my previous faith. And, the reality is like for folks who have such a strong pro-life stance and have so much of a Jesus forgives everybody and stuff, they really love guns and they really yes. love the death penalty. Yes. And that's like the biggest thing that just has baffled me. Like I've, I, in college, I remember just like, you know, having that juxtaposition and realizing like, cause I remember I had to write a paper about the death right. penalty. And I remember thinking like, well, I guess it's necessary sometimes, right? You know, and then I saw, I read some kind of thing that was like, he who has no sin, inject the first injection. And that was like my first kind of like, oh, like, yeah, if I really yeah. believe in grace and that people yes. can be rehabilitated, habilitated and, and forgiven, it doesn't mean that we have to, uh, you know, let them harm other people or let right. them out or do things. But when you make a mistake at 18 years old, and they kill you at 37 for it. Um, to me, that's 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 it's the, the really problem cool. of our... Yeah, it's the justice system doing exactly what it, it's intended to do, which is, um, yeah, there's no restoration in it at all. 
reconciliation. I think Christians need to just reevaluate the words and the deeds, right? Mm. And, you know, even Jesus gives you choice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Um, You know, I think one other thing, one of the big things I say to a lot of people, and I'm actually going to write a book with this title. All right, Justice. Um, <laughs> it's called Grace, Space, and Room to Self-Correct. That's my, my, that's my thing. Okay. Because people mess up. People mess up. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to give them grace and the space they need in this moment to correct what they're doing. Hmm. So it's grace, space, and room to self-correct. But it also comes with, you know, at some point, time is up. There is no more room to, like, if you're constantly. <laughs> and so we deal with that and we handle that. But lovingly, it's like my love letter to my community. Like, yeah. you need that. You need that grace and that space and that time to be like, okay, I'm messing up. I need to get it together. I don't mean myself. I don't like to be wrong. Um, and so if I ever am, I quickly get myself together. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, no, I'm not. I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm get, let me get together. Uh, <laughs> and so I know there are a lot of people who are like me. Who are like, no, they don't like that being in that position. It doesn't feel good. So I think we need to remember to give other people what we would want for ourselves. Absolutely. I would want some grace. Please give me some space and a little bit of room to get myself together before you come for me. You know? Mm. Um, yeah. Can't wait to read that book. Just yes. I guess as we kind of wrap up, um, so it sounds like maybe you'll be working on a book this year. Do you have any other projects or things you're working on? Definitely. Yeah. So, you know, we just won A3, Amendment 3. Thank you, all of my marijuana. Everybody can boys. get your marijuanas <laughs> come February. <laughs> so, um, with that, you know, that piece that was really important to me was expungement. So, I'm uh, our group, we're actually putting together a sign-up for people who have this on their record so that we can get them integrated with the office to help get the record expunged, right? Yeah. So I've talked to the prosecutor's office, Jane Peter Baker, Kansas City prosecutor. She is willing to help with that process, which I think is amazing, so that we can get this off of people's records. So that's one thing. <laughs> the other thing is, because of that, we have created a lane to get 3% of that funding for the city, right? And so I think it's... Um, fitting that Real Justice Network asked the mayor and city council for some of that money in order to put up a center, a healing and empowerment center for survivors. Wow. That's what we want to do. We don't really have a place right now. All of the service providers that are there aren't, uh, aren't in a space to do the kind of work that we need. And so this is really, 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 really crucial so yeah we're going to be running that campaign along with repro for mo you know that's going to last 2023 2024 really we're probably i was you know i was telling everybody we're going to the ballot in 2023 but because i want to make sure that we don't just do something and then it is i want to make sure that we leave the state more powerful than it is now Mm. so we need to be more intentional about building collective power that's sus- that is sustaining. So even after we win on a repro bill, we still can harness that power for whatever else comes at us and can use that. Sometimes we create these moments and we get something done, but we haven't did the work to create lasting power and those relationships. So this year, we're gonna do a repro tour. We're going all around the state. We're getting to know our folks. We're having meetings every month. We're going to be doing potlucks, all kinds of stuff. So that we can know each other. So Mm. that we can learn together. So that we can explain to some of our friends who are in this with us, but don't even really understand why we say the things we do. Mm. Um, They need to know. We want them to be educated. So come next year, when we're hitting the ground with this, we're all together. There's no confusion. We've been with each other. What? We've been eating together and everything. I trust them. We're going to go do, we're going to door knock. We're going to gather signatures. 
And so, you know, this is the way to do it with the lens, Mm -hmm. with the care, with the newborn baby, right? We could have rushed a birth. Like, inducer. (laughs) (laughs) Go ahead and induce this. We need to birth this thing right now. (laughs) But um, the healthier baby will be one (laughs) that we nurture before we carry the term push out (laughs) yeah absolutely so maybe 2024 2024 um but the work starts now and i think that's the best i mean talking to justin stein you mentioned that you know your friends and then you know Mm -hmm. on the show and it's like that's in missouri i just feel like that's the the slow growth and movement work in missouri is you have to sit down with people and have to hear what they're going through and mm-hmm. hear the issues because, yeah, other than Kansas City and St. Louis and Columbia, I guess, a little bit, you know. So I talk to Eric, like, I'm going to Springfield, I'm going to St. Joe, I'm going to all the little holes right. that don't nobody want to go to and talk to the folks that nobody, that everybody is ignoring. people got real life issues. Real like, life issues. And before the pandemic, I was all over Missouri, uh, especially in places that, where representation isn't great, mm-hmm. really talking to people and seeing what it is that's important to them and that matters to them. Um, and so I can't wait to get to doing that again. I can't wait for this tour that we're going to be on. Um, you know, a lot of our work is centered around repro. Um, we're going to ask everybody who is, you know, to join us in that work. We really need people. Uh, we need your voice. We need your energy. We need your time. Um, to do something really big and meaningful for Missouri. Um, And to say that what happened didn't impact Missouri would be false. Uh, My organization has received some really heartbreaking calls Mm. um, over the last couple of months and have helped people to get where they need to get to. I mean, I've talked to a lot of older women who became pregnant and can't carry a child. And um, the government doesn't understand that. They don't care about underlying conditions. They don't care about, you know, they don't care. They, just, yeah. they don't care. So And it shouldn't be up to them. And, and it shouldn't be up to them. And I say that we are more powerful than, than, our, than the government. I will say that we actually fund them. And we need to remind them that they actually work for us. Absolutely. Um, I'll say that again and again and again. But um, really, Micah, I think to leave off, leave something with people. I talk a lot about the light that we have. And I just want to encourage people to nurture it, to grow it, to not be afraid to find your community that's going to be helpful to find your people. Um, The people who, you know, not necessarily think like you because you want to be challenged in some of your thinking, but who you are, I don't don't even want to use the word comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. Get outside of your comfort, but don't block your light. Absolutely. Don't let anybody block your light government or otherwise government or otherwise (laughs) family friends even yourself yeah get out of your way absolutely you know that's my goal in 2023 (laughs) less self-sabotaging more work on that personal growth yes absolutely justice what a pleasure it's been having you on the show talking to you where can folks find you online I know. We are on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We also have a website. So let me give you the website. It is R E A L E J U S T I C E dot org, realjustice dot org. That's real with an E on the end. <laughs> and um, on Instagram, it's real underscore justice underscore network. And on what is it? Instagram. It's at social at S O C uh, justice. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. So S O C justice doula. Yeah. But find one of them and you'll find the others. 
And we're on Facebook as well, Rural Justice Network. Just look us up. Um, if you have questions about organizing activism, birth work, um, reach out. I love answering those questions and talking about those subjects. If you are down to rock with us in this repro space, we need you. Please reach out. Uh, we are building this up. It's going to be amazing, and we want you a part of it. Um, and I just want to let all the folks out there, Kansas City especially, know how much I love Kansas City, how much I love our community, how mm. much I love our folks, and how much I want to see us not just, you know, be living, but thriving. Mm. We can do it. Yep. We can. Yep. And everybody... Thanks for checking out. Make sure you go uh, check out Justice's website, realjustice.org. And as always, you can follow Pray for Micah Pod on your Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Also check out PrayForMicah.com. Uh, also, I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out if I'm going to do uh, Patreon or some kind of thing. So if you want to like shoot me a comment or an email or have an idea of something, what kind of merch or shirts or things you'd like to possibly get, give me any ideas you like. Cause uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm still just trying to figure out how to get the recording stuff done. So <laughs> we'll get there. So uh, until next time. Till next time. Thanks for joining me for the pray for Micah podcast. Be sure to like subscribe and leave a review and Check out my YouTube channel and follow me on social media. Pray for Micah Pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. We'll see you next time. You are now re-entering the normal world. 